With the recent release of Sonic Origins, much of the discussions within the Sonic community, if not on the issues regarding Origins itself, have been focused on the series' earliest mainline releases on the Genesis, and amongst the iconic trilogy of Sonic 1, Sonic 2, and Sonic 3 and Knuckles, grouped within that bunch is the title that for all intents and purposes has become the black sheep in the Genesis era of the franchise, Sonic CD. I just want to put out there that Sonic CD is one of the most beloved and cherished games that I will always have a deep passion for. That being said, there are many aspects of CD that have been discussed for ages touching on how it sticks out like a sore thumb next to both its immediate predecessors and successors. Whether it's the time travel mechanic that would put a focus on platforming and exploration instead of speeding fluently through stages, the super peel out ability, the purposefully challenging level design, the special stages, or even the variant of the spin dash. However, almost all of these changes in one way or another are due to the different direction and trajectory the game took during its development since it was made for hardware that was separate from the Genesis, the Sega CD. Hey! You still don't have a Sega CD? Huh? What are you waiting for, Nintendo to make one? <laughs> you have seen the games, right? Uh, Wrong uh, answer, man. Show them! <laughs> Wanna see more? <laughs> Obviously, there are certain qualities of the game that have no excuse but to marginally improve using CD format compared to the Genesis humble capabilities. Using CD-ROMs instead of ROM cartridges increased data storage from a measly range of 8 to 16 megabytes to over 640, an impressive number in the early 90s. Many titles utilized the new hardware to make strides in visual improvements, animated cutscenes, and larger scope of game. With Sonic CD, I can wholeheartedly say that the title's biggest benefit from the CD-ROM format was its ambitious original soundtrack. One that, within a franchise known for its consistent strength from a musical sense, still stands out from the rest of the crowd. One that would epitomize the sound and spirit of the Blue Blur in a way that wasn't attempted prior. One with a history so important and intertwined between the mediums of music and video games that it deserves to have its story told separate from the Sonic trilogy or even from Sonic CD itself. So, let's talk about Classic Sonic's most polarizing soundtrack, Sonic CD's OST, A Sound of the Times. Despite the Genesis storybook success and subsequent rise in the early 90s, compact discs more commonly referred to as CDs, were making a strong headway in the innovation scene as means of storage for music and video games. Japanese information technology company NEC was the first to use the CD technology in a console with their PC Engine CD-ROM add-on in October of 1988 in Japan, later released in the States as the TurboGrafx CD. Nintendo would infamously announce a partnership with Sony to develop their own CD-ROM system in tandem with Sega's rival console, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. A case in itself that would go on to have an immeasurable impact on the industry forever on. After the release of the Genesis, Sega's Consumer Products Research and Development Labs had the duty of incepting a CD-ROM add-on for the Mega Drive initially intended to be on par with the power of the TurboGrafx CD, but with double the random access memory, aka RAM. In addition to the high RAM output, the team desired hardware scaling similar to that of Sega's arcade games, which required a dedicated digital signal processor. A custom graphics chip would be implemented in these features, alongside an additional sound chip. The cost of the console rose to $370 USD. 
but Sega executives were convinced that the customers were willing to pay more for an optimized unit. As early as 1990, media began to loud in rumors of a CD-ROM peripheral for the Mega Drive. Sega would announce the release of the Mega CD in Japan for late 1991, and in North America as the Sega CD the year following in 1992. Revealed to the Eastern public at the 1991 Tokyo Toy Show, and to the West at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago that same year. It was officially released in Japan on December 12, 1991. Within its first three months, the Mega CD sold 200,000 units. On October 15, 1992, the Sega CD was released in North America with a retail price of $299. With the system released, all that was needed was for a big game to truly draw consumers towards the Mega CD and its lackluster roster of games at that point. That's where Sega was quick to turn to their new golden child who had just recently helped change the trajectory of the entire company, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic's first game in 1991 was developed by Sonic Team at Sega. Sega's director at the time had connections to the music industry and presented his good friend Yuzoi Kayama with an offer to write the score for their new and exciting title. However, Sonic Team did not believe that Kayama's sound would mesh with their vision of Sonic, so they reached out to Masato Nakamura, the bassist of the Japanese band Dreams Come True. After he finished what would become the score of Sonic the Hedgehog, the music was digitalized using an Atari ST and the known program Notator. As we all would come to know, Sonic 1 was a major commercial success. The game's score would become one of the more revered and legendary among the video game titles of the 90s, and the theme for Sonic's debut stage, Green Hill Zone, would go on to be the character's synonymous theme as well as one of the most identifiable and recurring themes in the relatively young history of gaming. Sonic 1 skyrocketed Sega into a prominent position as Nintendo's main competitor in the console market. However, the lead programmer, Yuji Naka, dissatisfied with Sega Japan's work environment, relocated with several members of Sonic Team to the United States to develop the game's sequel with Sega Technical Institute. Simultaneously, Sega, now with the Sega CD add-on in their hands, needed a Sonic game that would demonstrate the console's more advanced features. Naoto Oshima, Sonic's original designer, was the director of Sonic CD. The remainder of the team consisted of Sega staff who had developed other larger titles within the company's report. Building Sonic CD using the original one code as a base. Sonic CD was initially supposed to be a souped up port of Sonic 2 for the Sega CD. As with Sonic 1, Sonic 2 soundtrack was composed by Nakamura. Sega of America had initially wanted to use music that was composed in-house. Instead, but the demo results were more than lackluster and Sega would rehire Nakamura. He began composing early in the game's development, with only concept art for reference. He would approach the music for Sonic 2 like an original soundtrack for a film, with the desire to reflect the atmosphere he perceived from the concept art. Since Sonic 2 was more technically advanced than his predecessor, Nakamura wanted to create music that showed progress. SCI let him work freely using a Roland MC4 Micro Composer. Creating the compositions was challenging, as the Genesis was limited in its sound capabilities, but he was encouraged to be creative. A small group worked to format Nakamura's score onto the Genesis soundboard. This hypothetical Mega CD port of Sonic 2 would look to build greatly upon Nakamura's pre-established work, with the game being codenamed Super Sonic and looking to feature a fully orchestrated soundtrack. Despite those ambitions, less than favorable sales of Sonic 2 in Japan, as well as the team slowly forming its own grand vision, resulted in the port concept being left behind. It was then titled CD Sonic the Hedgehog first, before being renamed to Sonic CD. And with the capabilities of the Mega CD in mind, an impressive creative journey would begin underway to find and form a new sound for the series that up to that point had been shaped almost entirely by one J-pop based guitarist. In charge of composing the soundtrack of Sonic CD was Nefumi Hataya alongside Masafumi Ogata, who had previously collaborated together for Sonic on the Master System version of Sonic 2. With the Mega CD's capabilities, there were no more hardware limitations to restrain creative potential. 
With that in their minds, the early demos of the game's soundtrack would come out as flat and lackluster compared to their ambitions and vision for the final product. So, Hataya, Ogata, and their team would look outward to take new input towards identifying the true sound of Sonic. They would look at how Sonic's character was received by fans outside of Japan, how his personality was perceived and received in places like Europe and the States, and what music would most closely associate with those traits in those regions. What they discovered was that the Hedgehog's cool, righteous, and rebellious character could easily be associated with the trendier sounds of the late 80s and early 90s. Those sounds being hip-hop, club, techno, and house music. House music in particular was an intriguing approach, as the genre had just begun to make reach in Japan and make waves within their own music scene. Now having a clearer concept for this new, bold approach, Hataya would take influence from acts like CNC Music Factory, Frankie Knuckles, and the KLF, as they began to assemble CD's soundtrack. The team would make the integral decision to use popular sample packs on the market that were utilized by house artists at the time. The ones in particular are Data File 1 and Data File 2 by Zero G, as well as the UK sample CD, The Ecstatic Goldmine by Polestar Magnetics. The many samples in those discs contain many, if not a majority, of the rhythmic and polarizing sounds that Hataya's team made use of to build Sonic CD's soundtrack. These sample sets had sounds from many funk, soul, house, dance, and rock acts including Jocelyn Brown, War, Miami, The Scientist, Cool in the Gang, Xavier, and The Stone Roses. The music budget for this was far greater in comparison to the Genesis titles and work was done in hand with one of the most prolific music production companies in Japan. They would summon Casey Rankin and Kaito Yutoku for the game's opening and closing respectively, with the former song taken directly from Ogata's previous Sonic work, turning Sonic 2's Green Hills Zone theme into the adventurous Toot Toot Sonic Warrior. Arguably the most impressive detail within the original soundtrack's conceptualization was that the strong and catchy motifs created would be adapted to the main storyline and gimmick of Sonic CD's gameplay, time travel. For each of the six zones in the game, Palm Tree Panic, Collision Chaos, Tidal Tempest, Quartz Quadrant, Wacky Workbench, Stardust Speedway, and Metallic Madness, there would be a composed theme for each zone. However, there would be four iterations of the theme that would reflect the time period in which Sonic was currently traversing. The standard present themes would be the base motif of the zone. The bad future themes would take a more unnerving and automated tone to convey that the player did not achieve what was required for the good ending. The good future themes would aim to be vibrant and lively or peaceful to show that the player successfully saved that region of Little Planet. The most interesting ones though were the past themes. Disk space was still a challenge for the composers, as game data would only leave enough space for about an hour of music. To save space, the past renditions were made utilizing the Mega CD's own 8 channel PCM audio chip. A decision that would go on to benefit the time zone concept, as the older themes made using the older way of formatting the music would make the sounds more primal and in the past. That being said, that technical difference would eventually be the reason why the past themes are the same amongst all regional versions of Sonic CD's soundtrack. More on that shortly. Sonic CD's ending theme, Cosmic Eternity, Believe in Yourself, composed by Hataya, would be performed by Utoku as well. Reception of Sonic CD's original soundtrack was high, with praise growing as the game has aged leaving the franchise with many notable tunes that would hold weight amongst the series' continuity for years to come. None more prominently than the bad feature theme for Stardust Speedway, a track that would become synonymous to the then newly introduced Metal Sonic, as much as Green Hill was for the Blue Blur. That being said, no risk is ever taken without some pushback, and committing to the bold and brash sound led to some disagreements when it came time for the game to be localized outside of Japan. Oddly enough, in North America of all regions, where many of the sounds and genres sampled in CD's OST originated in terms of the artist and inspirations. Regardless, Joe Miller, head of Sega's multimedia studio at the time, believed it was best for his division to try a different approach for the US release. 
the North American team, led by Spencer Nilsson alongside David Young, would rush to put together an entirely new soundtrack in just seven weeks with the help of former Santana keyboardist Mark Crew. Crew's tracks would feature fellow Santana member Armando Peraza as percussionist. According to Nilsson, Sega's American marketing division believed that it needed a more rich and complex soundtrack and a theme song that they could use to promote it. While the Japanese team was fully committed to the heavy, trendy influences in the soundtrack, the U.S. composers were opposed to it. They were aiming for a more quirky and vibrant approach in line with their perspective of Sonic and his environments. In the undergoing of their rewrite of the original soundtrack, Nielsen and his team came across a problematic obstacle. Since the Sega CD allowed for music to be recorded on a disc, they were able to manage just recording new compositions and rewriting them onto the discs, replacing the initial tracks. However, they would have to go inside the Sega CD sound chip in order to change the music for the past time zones, a large order that the team simply did not have the time to handle completely. Therefore, they had no choice but to leave the past themes untouched in order to stay on their tight schedule. The end result would be a more reserved and default soundtrack that lacked the environmental consistency and awareness and polish that the original soundtrack had, sacrificing the crucial time zone motif that the Japanese team put so much conceptualization into. The stark difference between the original and North American soundtracks has since become a long and debated discussion in the Sonic fanbase, and critics have not held their tongues regarding their stances on the matter whenever covering Sonic CD. GameFan, which had given the Japanese version of Sonic CD a score of 100, lambasted the change. GameFan editor Dave Halverson called the change an atrocity that remains the biggest injustice in localization history. The reviewer for Games Radar said he shut his GameCube off in disgust when he realized the Sonic Gems collection port of CD used the American soundtrack. In a 2008 interview, Nielsen would go on to say, I think critics were looking for a way to bash the game. It was like we replaced the music for Star Wars after the movie had been out for a while. One track that would be exempt from contention would be what would eventually become the lasting legacy of the North American soundtrack, the overarching theme of the game, Sonic Boom. Composed by Nielsen himself, the vocal jazz group Pastige was responsible for the vocal performance in both the opening and closing iterations of the song. Sonic CD itself would go on to be another commercial success for the series, becoming the best-selling Sega CD title of all time, a great individual achievement despite the console's commercial failure. As the series moved on after CD's release, all the teams involved would have to collaborate intensely for the third installment in the mainline trilogy of the Hedgehog's Genesis titles, as Sonic 3 would become the most expansive undertaking that the series had seen yet, and that would be no different for the game's music as its development would infamously bring in yet another outside production group into the fold for a boisterous new sound. This time though, it wasn't a prestigious Japanese studio, but one of the biggest names in the history of musicians. But that is a well documented story for another time. If you made it to the end of the video, I truly truly appreciate you. Sorry this took so long to get out, but since this is not only my 50th video on the channel, but my 1000 subscriber special, I wanted to make sure that I did it as thoroughly as I envisioned. This last year and a half making content has been a fun challenge for me, and I feel extremely fortunate that I've even managed to build this channel up to this point. Thank you for all of your support. Here's what's to come next. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment as well and let me know what your favorite track is from Sonic CD. Personally, I don't think I can choose. It might truly be my favorite OST of all time. Anyways, let me not keep you guys any longer. As always, take care, good game, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time around. Peace.